All right, I um, just want to welcome Grant Van Horn uh, to speak to us today. Grant's coming here from Caltech, where um, he is finishing up his PhD with Pietro Perona, and before that he does master's and undergrad at UCSD working with Serge Belongi. Uh, Grant's done a lot of work on fine grain classification, particularly around um, ant species recognition, and has work, been working with the iNaturalist organization, and um, he's going to tell us about that work today. So welcome, Grant. Thank you. Yeah, thanks guys for having me. Um, yeah, I'll, just like Neil said, let me just click on this. Um, I did my undergrad and master's uh, with Surge at UCSD, and then I did uh, my PhD. I just defended back in September um, with Pietro at Caltech. Um, and uh, I just wanted to give you guys a brief overview of my work, um, and then I'll dive into a specific project. Um, so at UCSD, um, or pretty much all my work revolves around fine-grained visual classification. And so the kind of the classic um, example of that for the computer vision field is bird species um, classification. Um, and so while I was at UCSD, um, I did contributions for algorithmic improvements for uh, FGVC. And then I also worked on um, human-in-the-loop um, systems, where you combine a human um, and a machine to try and arrive at the correct um, classification answer. Uh, and then I've also worked on building FGVC data sets. Um, so I've worked on the NA birds data set that has um, 500 species of, of North American birds, the iNaturalist um, 2017 and 2018 data sets with 5,000 and 8,000 species respectively, um, and then most recently I helped Sarah build um, the Caltech camera traps data set. Uh, and then um, I have have quite a bit of experience on like efficiently collecting those data sets. Um, and so this was work primarily done with Steve Branson um, at Caltech. And so I'll, I'll be mainly talking about um, this project today. Um, but just to give like a much bigger picture uh, of my work, I basically have spent my graduate career um, working with these two partners, the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, um, which I'll just refer to as the Lab of O, um, and iNaturalist, um, to build um, these two products, um, so the Merlin Bird ID, and iNaturalist, and so I kind of sit in the middle where I cut my teeth learning how to collect the data, um, learning how to train the computer vision models on those data, and then figuring out how to deploy those things um, to power these, um, these apps in production. And rather than describe those apps, um, I'll just give you guys a demo of them. And so um, I'm sure we've all, everyone in this room has probably had the experience of being outside, whether it's over at the Sound or up in the mountains or like even in a park around here where you, you see something, uh, uh, you see wildlife and, and you don't know what it is. I mean, you know it's a butterfly or a flower or a tree, but you don't know what the species is. And so to tap into the information about the species, it requires um, like a weird text search um, on a search engine, or if you have a field guide, you, you, you flip through the pages of a field guide and try and, and find the, the information. And so the apps I'm about to demo um, were designed to help you answer that, like what is this question, uh, through computer vision. And so this uh, first one I'm gonna show is Merlin. And so this is a project or an app that I helped build with Cornell. And it helps you classify birds um, through photographs. Um, so I'll use a field guide so you guys know I'm giving you the right answers. So here we're trying to classify a pileated woodpecker. Uh, we can take a photo. And uh, the first thing that Merlin asks us to do is, is crop the bird. Uh, and then it asks us for location information. So here I'll just skip this. Um, and then it um, runs the computer vision and it, and it gives us results. And one really nice thing with Merlin is that all these operations happened on the device, so there was no network connection required. Um, and we can see that Pileated Woodpecker comes up. And Cornell has done a good job of giving us some really pretty images of the bird. We get this um, text description of it. Uh, they've incorporated sounds into the app along with range maps. So a photo along with computer vision allowed us to tap into this encyclopedic knowledge. It's on the box. It has to have everything in it, right? Yeah, it's got everything in it. So how big is the app? So you download expansion packs. The, the, you download a, a general computer vision model, and then the content is for particular regions of the world. So that, that content was like American, but you can get Mexico, South America, Europe. Um, so that's how they've sort of handled that content scaling problem. Um, yeah, so the question is, is like, can we do this for everything? Um, and so that's what this middle app, iNaturalist, is doing. 
And I'm going to talk about iNaturalist in depth throughout the rest of this talk, but I'll just give you a, a demonstration of um, the computer vision capabilities. So in iNaturalist, you make observations. So this time we'll observe a blue dasher. So this is, we're looking for this blue dasher to come up. So again, we'll take a photo. Um, and unlike Merlin, the computer vision system for iNAT actually runs up in the cloud. So when I hit this what did you see button, it's going to send the photo to the iNAT servers and then this, the suggestions are going to come back. And if the network works, yeah, we, we, we see Blue Dasher uh, at the top of these species suggestions. So if you've got a network connection, this works pretty well. Um, and iNAT is trying to tackle everything. So what's left to demo, right? What's, um, what, what, what is up with this third app? Well, the, the cool thing with the third one is um, it's basically the iNaturalist computer vision system, but implemented on the device. Um, so we've taken the full iNat um, species classifier and put it on your phone so that you can just run it without the network connection. And um, uh, the rest of the talk will pretty much be about how I built the data set to power this app. Um, and so a few things to note. It does... Um, uh, hierarchical classification, so we start with kingdom up top and it goes down to species down below. And then there's some like frames per second and CPU utilization information at the top there. Um, so we can go back to our, we're looking for pileated woodpecker to come up and so we can put the phone over pileated woodpecker and see that. We can turn the page. We can look for peregrine falcon, put the phone over peregrine falcon and see that come up. And again, looking at that bottom species ID. Merlin was named after this little dude. So this is the Merlin bird. We can put our phone over it, and we can see that Merlin comes up. <clears throat> Move over to dragonflies. We're looking for that blue dasher to come up. Um, on the next page over, we have the, the checkered set wing. And so again, put your phone over that. Checkered set wing comes up. The, Nash, or the state fish for Washington is the golden or the rainbow trout. So we can put our phone over that and see rainbow trout come up. Your guys' um, state flower is the Pacific rhododendron. And so we can put our phone over that and see that come up nicely. I come from Caltech, so hopefully we can classify the American beaver. Uh, that's our mascot, and we can. And then I mountain bike a lot, and one of the things I'm worried about is poison oak. Um, and so now we can, I can just take my phone out and point my phone at the leaves and see poison oak come up. Um, okay, so there's... This, so this app has like all the knowledge on Naturalist stored in the computer vision model. It runs at 60 hertz on an iPhone 7. And there is nothing about network pruning or um, qu uh, quantization uh, or knowledge distillation. The thing that made this thing fast is sort of a new algorithmic trick that I'll publish at CV or that I'll submit to CVPR this year. Um, that's one thing that makes this thing fast. The other thing is getting your data set right. Um, and... Uh, the rest of the talk will be about making the data set. OK. Sorry, how does it work with occlusion and other things? Uh, with occlusion? Oh, yeah. Oh, it's, it's, so it's just a raw image classifier. So it's just taking, taking the image in and, and classifying it. So let's say if there's a bird, occluded bird? Yep. So it's still it will work? Oh, yeah. So, I mean, like, it'll definitely tell you a prediction. Um, and in that case, what I would like for it to do is be like, if it could know that it's occluded and, and give you information about taking a photograph or, like, moving in a direction where it become unoccluded would be kind of, like, the, the idea. So it's, yeah, I'll talk about this at the end. But basically, now that we got this thing running on the phone, it opens up a huge world of, like, new user interactions where it's, like, the machine can directly talk to the human about, like, Hey, you're looking at a mushroom. Like, can you get a different angle so that we can improve our classification results for you? Or, um, yeah, so it's it's pretty exciting. Um, okay, so yeah, so the so the the talk overview. I'll do a big picture um, about this work. Um, then I'll I'll describe what iNaturalist is. Um, I'll spend the majority of the talk in this multi-class crowdsourcing um, project, and then I'll end by just um, discussing some of the next steps I'd like to take in terms of research. Okay, so um, I want to start with the big picture, and I want to try to convince you that I haven't just been like a code monkey for iNaturalist, um, and that the problems I'm trying to tackle are more general. 
Um, so there exist communities of knowledge, right? And, and these communities are a distributed social network of people. Um, and so some examples include engineering, the natural sciences, stamp collectors, car enthusiasts. Perhaps the most iconic and classic example is the medical field, right? So doctors specialize and have domain expertise in particular areas. And if they encounter something they haven't seen before um, or that's outside their area, then they reach out to their friends and colleagues for help um, who are able to reach out to their friends and colleagues. And so ultimately, either the missing information is found or a new medical case is described. And so an important aspect of this community is that as a whole, it's greater than the sum of the individuals, right? So the collective knowledge held in this network, um, the network of people is greater than just the individuals themselves. And these communities of knowledge are not new. They've been around for a long time. But modern technology is bringing in some new components. Um, so the internet has made things faster and easier. Um, and so the, the type of information that colleagues can share has become much richer, including images, videos, documents, code. Um, we now also have the ability to store all this data. So these communities are not only supporting knowledge, but large amounts of data. And the world is becoming more connected. So right, we can get more people are finding and joining these communities, as well as starting brand new ones. And so the bigger picture questions that I've tried to investigate are, can we learn from these communities? Can we learn who knows what and what their area of focus is? And can we learn how to combine information from multiple people in a community? Um, and two, can we distill the distributed network knowledge of these communities and make it centralized and consolidated so that anybody, anywhere, can access it quickly and efficiently? Right? And I've used the community and the data from iNaturalist to try and answer these questions. Um, so now I'm going to introduce INAT. And a lot of the work that um, is covered in this part was um, presented at CDPR this year in a spotlight presentation. Um, so iNaturalist is a platform that helps connect people with nature. Uh, users take photographs of species and upload them along with the geolocation as an observation. And then the iNaturalist community then helps the user identify the species in their photograph. And ultimately, by aggregating many of these observations, iNaturalist aims to help scientists understand the distribution and abundance of species over time. So these observations come from users all over the world, and the number of observations uh, submitted per month is growing rapidly. So if the trend holds, iNaturalist hopes to aggregate 50 million observations in the year 2020 alone. Do you ensure that the observations are correct? Is there validations and so on? Yeah, that's pretty much what all the rest of the talk will be about, trying to figure out what the correct ID is for an image. <clears throat> um, someone said, OK, this is the picture of a lizard or whatever, and yep. give it a name. Uh -huh. Then do you actually verify that? Whatever identity the person has ascribed to the image is correct. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's what we're going to try and solve. So that labeling <coughs> task, I'll, I'll demonstrate that if you get that right, you can build more accurate data sets than if you just trusted what the person um, said from the, from the beginning. All right, so I'll give a concrete example of an observation. Um, so this is a lizard that got into our lab at Caltech. Um, and to create an observation, I snapped a photo of it um, and uploaded it to INAT. And so on INAT, this observation gets initialized with the tag needs ID. Um, and different me uh, members of the community notified about this picture um, through various means suggest identifications. And so in this case, uh, four people put uh, an ID on this image. Um, and iNaturalist uses majority vote to decide the final identification. So in this example, everyone agreed. So there's 100% <laughs> consensus. Uh, but in general, INAT requires more than a two-thirds consensus at the species level um, before an observation gets this research grade label. OK, and so why is research grade important? Well, those are the observations that iNaturalist bundles up and provides to scientists um, who are going to use it for distribution and abundance modeling. So the quality of the research grade labels matters, uh, especially if we want to answer scientific questions using that data. Who are, who are the people who are submitting those initial uh, labels? Yeah, anybody. Anybody from the community. Okay. Yep. Is there a minimum number that you expect? Uh, so if, with their current setup, you, you have to have um, at least two people agreeing on the species before it gets this research grade label. Is that? Yeah, I mean, so minimum, let's say you, know, you snap a picture and only one person responded. And it can't go to research grade okay. until someone comes along, yep. 
Okay, so the yeah, so the observations submitted to INAT span like pretty much all the different areas of the natural world, uh, and they can be roughly divided into these fourteen um, super categories. Uh, and I'll give some uh, example observations for a few different species. So this example highlights the species with high intraclass variation. Right? So these are all observations of the red deer, which is a, a deer from Europe and Asia, um, but each image captures a very different aspect uh, of the animal. Um, and this is a particularly fun example. This shows two different lady um, bird species. So in Britain and on iNaturalist, it's the common name is lady bird rather than lady bug, um, where the number of spots is crucial for identification. Right? So you have the, the two spotted lady bird here and the seven spotted lady bird here. Um, okay, so if you simply just download all of the iNaturalist research grade observations, then you can start building computer vision data sets. Um, and this is exactly what we did for the INET um, 2017 and 2018 data sets. And so the 2017 version had about 5,000 species, and the 2018 version um, had over 8,000 species. And um, okay, so what, what kind of performance can modern computer vision uh, models get on this data set? Uh, well, they can actually get pretty good results. Um, so this left column represents off-the-shelf models. Um, so these are models that are easy to train and relatively cheap to deploy, uh, especially on servers. And so the, the models, so this would be like um, downloading the, the pre-trained Inception V3 model or something, or the pre-trained ResNet model. Um, this column represents like competition style models where people just like train a ton of networks, ensemble all the predictions together and do like average voting or something. And then they, they normally like boost the resolution. So you go from 224 by 224 to like 500 or something. So everything just gets much more expensive and you'd be hard pressed to like actually deploy these kind of things in a production setting. They're just too expensive. Um, really, you're kind of more like in this um, area. <clears throat> um, but these are actually pretty good numbers, right? So remember, we're doing 5,000 and 8,000 way classification. Um, and so like 60, 65% is actually pretty dang good. Um, and a model similar to this is actually what's powering the INAT computer vision server right now. Um, and so one question we can ask is just, are we done? You know, like, was that research grade data set good enough? Um, and can we say mission accomplished? Uh, and so to answer this question, we can take a look at one of the threads on the iNaturalist Google group, which is primarily used by power users to communicate with the iNAT team. And this thread is called um, Hoping Artificial Intelligence IDs Will Get Better. <clears throat> And so I'm just going to read a few of these for you guys. So I'm amazed at how well AI works on plants. At the same time, I'm exasperated on how bad it is at IDing cicadas. I just looked at an observation that was super obvious resh cicada. The AI's first choice was a swamp cicada, which is totally obviously wrong. Resh was listed something like seventh choice. Resh has 435 research grade observations. Swamp cicada has 293. I'm hoping AI will eventually get better. Okay, and so in the same thread later on, um, we have uh, another message, this time from Susan Hewitt, um, who's like an amazing malacologist who's contributed over 50,000 identifications on iNaturalist. And so she says, the AI is currently really terrible on marine mollusks outside of California. It tries to ID everything in the world based on the most similar California species. I spend quite a bit of time correcting this kind of error. Okay. And so later on in that same thread, she replied again, um, and I'll just read this. So obviously the AI will get better over time, even on mollusks, but that process of improvement depends on there being more expert humans on here creating accurate mollusk identifications that can be used to train the AI. And currently on iNaturalist, there just aren't enough really active malacologists, amateur or professional. In fact, there are only about 400 malacologists in existence worldwide, and goodness knows how many of them we can recruit to help out here. So the question is, what can we do in the meantime to soften the impact of so many wrong mollusk IDs being offered and, and embraced by new users? Okay, so, <laughs> like, you know, this is actually a particularly, like, insightful message, uh, and, it, and it provides a great segue into the rest of my um, project. Um, but let me just illustrate the problems that Susan's referring to. Um, okay, so here we have an observation of an Asian ladybird. Right? This is the true species label um, for this image. Uh, and we've had two identifiers come in, and both of them have had said seven-spotted ladybird. Now, it could be the case that this user used computer vision to get this label. You, know, you uploaded it to the computer vision system, it replied back with this, and they trusted the computer vision system. And then this person has simply agreed with, with uh, their identification. And so now we have greater than a two-thirds consensus 
So this observation gets a research grade label of seven spotted ladybird, but the true identification was Asian ladybird, right? So we've effectively corrupted the iNaturalist database, um, and it could have been because we introduced the computer vision system. Okay, so another illustration of a similar problem can be seen here. So in this case, only the first user made a mistake. Um, so again, we, we're still, the true identification is Asian ladybird. The first user says seven spotted. But then we need three additional users to come in to get that two-thirds consensus in order to get this thing to research grade on Asian ladybird. And so, and again, perhaps this person used computer vision to get this initial um, identification. And so because of computer vision, we may have required more people to put IDs on this photo than would normally be required. And like Susan pointed out, the experts are a scarce resource, right? And so their time shouldn't be wasted on doing these kind of tasks. And finally, so this gets back to your question. Um, in this case, we have a lonely expert, right? So we've had one person that comes in and provides a correct identification. But because no one else has come in, this thing is just going to sit in the needs ID purgatory. Um, and so now in this example, computer vision isn't necessarily to blame for the problem, but it relates back to those big picture questions that I was talking about. Um, and so I'd say we've taken a pretty good crack at trying to distill the knowledge of the iNaturalist community and make it accessible by anybody, anywhere. Uh, the problem is, is that we built this thing, we put it out into the wild, and we've completely ignored learning from the community. Right? So the model's not aware of the skills of the users, or, nor is it aware of how to combine information from multiple people. And because of this, we've introduced additional burdens on the community. And perhaps, worst of all, those burdens are falling on the expert users of the system, right? those whose time we're trying to optimize. So getting this feedback uh, and observing how the iNaturalist system performs made me realize that building a machine for uh, number two necessitates that we build a machine for number one. Right? Otherwise, we risk collapsing the community, or at the very least, corrupting the knowledge of the community by introducing too many unskilled users uh, who are too eagerly trusting the computer vision uh, results. OK, so now I'm going to discuss our attempt to build models that can learn from the community and try to help mitigate those problems. And so this work was also presented at CVPR this year uh, and was another spotlight presentation. Um, so I'm going to break it down um, into three blocks. <clears throat> and so first I'll introduce the problem and build up uh, models of worker classification skills. Uh, and these models, however, don't capture the way iNaturalist works, so we're going to adapt them to handle situations where users can see previous identifications before providing their own. Um, and then we're going to adapt the models to handle um, users choosing labels from a taxonomy rather than uh, just a flat list. <clears throat> okay, so let's dive in. Uh, to reiterate, we're trying to model users, and I'll call them workers um, as well, that are doing a multi-class classification task. Right, so in this example, um, the task given to a worker is to label an image with the species of a bird. And there's about 10,000 bird species in the world, so when a worker annotates an image, they're choosing one label out of 10,000 options. <clears throat> and we're going to get a series of these annotations from different workers. So in this case, workers A and B labeled the image as snowy egret, and worker C labeled it as great egret. And so what we're after is a model that can learn from this data and it's capable of predicting the class label for an image. Right? And so the most popular instantiation is to simply do majority vote, like iNaturalist currently does, and such a model would output snowy egret as the prediction for this image. Um, but we want a model that can learn the skills of the workers and take those skills into account when predicting the label. All right, so such a model would learn that worker C is more skilled than workers A and B, and the prediction would be great egret. And so brief aside, to give proper attribution to previous work, I'm far from the first to consider this problem. Um, Daweed and Skeen were probably the first in their 79 paper where they were trying to learn the skills of doctors and combine those skills to uh, predict a prognosis for a patient. And then there's been a steady stream of work since then. Um, and that stream really turned into a river after uh, Mechanical Turk was launched in 2005. Uh, and so you guys are probably aware, but that platform allows researchers to tap into a large crowd workforce and lets you run experiments um, more quickly and easily. And this, this resulted in kind of like a wave of papers coming out, um, and it continues to today. Um, and uh, my work is different from these previous works in that I tackle a much larger um, class space than has been, than has been considered before. Uh, my models can handle a dependence between the annotators, um, and I incorporate a, a computer vision model. Uh, and finally, I incorporated taxonomy 
um, that allows workers to hedge their bets and makes a system more computationally tractable. Um, so these features will be presented shortly. Um, okay, so back to this basic setup. Um, I'll now introduce the notation I'm going to use for this model. <coughs> so the variable x is going to represent an image, and the subscript i uh, indexes the current image. The underlying true label for an image will be denoted by y, and is also indexed by that image id uh, i. Uh, and uh, that variable can take one of c values that represents one of the c possible classes we're trying to identify. You know, so for example, snowy egret or great egret. Um, and that variable is never revealed to us, right? We never get to see it. Um, but a prediction of the variable, denoted by y tilde, um, is the output of our model. Right? And that's, that variable is restricted to the same value set as y, um, namely one of those C classes that we're trying to predict. In this example, it's great egret. Um, the worker annotations are going to be denoted by z, and they're indexed by an image ID and a worker ID. So they can be interpreted as worker A's annotation on image I. Um, and these annotations can also just take one of those C possible class labels. And finally, the worker skills um, are going to be denoted by variable W, and they're going to be also indexed by this worker ID. Um, and in this cartoon, the skills represent a, a confusion matrix. Um, OK, so if we look under the hood of this model, um, when it's trying to predict a label for an image, we're simply going to compute uh, the likelihood of every class, given the annotations for the image, and then just return the most likely one, right? where Z sub I. A big Z sub I is the, the set of annotations for image I. And um, if we take a look at that likelihood computation, we can expand it out using Bayes' rule. Um, but then we get stuck with this annoying term here, uh, which is the probability of all of these annotations um, together uh, given a particular um, class. And that's not the easiest thing to model. Um, so we're going to make an independence assumption and assume that we can express the likelihood of all the annotations given the class as a product of the likelihood of the individual annotations given the class label, <coughs> um, which would change the picture to look like this. Right? So we've broken this problem into an, an easier problem. Um, and it's actually much more manageable because we have two terms. Uh, so the first is simply the class priors, and those are basically just an input into our system, so there's not really a difficulty there. Um, and then we have this term here, uh, which is the likelihood of a worker's response, so Z's, given a class label and their skills. Okay, and so we need to implement this term, and it turns out to be very straightforward. Uh, we're simply going to use a matrix that's indexed by the class label and the worker annotation. Um, and so our skill variable, W, is the matrix. Right? And this matrix is, is responsible for holding the probability that a worker will label an image with Zij when the image really contains the class label Y sub I. And so pictorially, every worker is going to have one of these uh, skill matrices. Right? And we're going to be able to index into that skill matrix to retrieve, for example, the probability that the worker labels an image as great egret when the image was really of a snowy egret. OK, so let me give a visual example. Yeah. So it's, I mean, the independence assumption that you're making <coughs> seems to exactly miss yeah. the problem you were describing before, where they, where they see each other's predictions. Yeah, yeah. So I'll just, How does that work? Yeah, so I'll just build up the, the skill matrix, and then I'll tackle the, oh, I'll, okay. go back, I'll go back to that and, and, and fix it. Yeah. So as you're building this up, you need to know C. Right, C is a constant and known constant, right? So which means that when you start, you need to decide on the database of all the mm. species. Oh yes, right? yes, yes. And so when the people are actually labeling, are they looking up those names from a like a list of like is that like a text search? Like they type in egret and yeah, well, yeah. things pop up. Okay. Yeah, and it's like so the number of options they can choose from is six hundred and fifty thousand. That's the autocomplete size. Yeah, so it's a long, and that's that's for the whole taxonomy. So the number of leaf nodes is on the order of half a million options. And so this matrix is C by C. Yeah, yeah, and I'll get tackle that too. <laughs> what do they do when they when they know the answer is not in your database? Oh, so they can also go modify the taxonomy. If 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 someone uh, there's they have taxonomy um, czars or taxonomy managers that can go in and actually add nodes if they're missing. So, so every subject sees the same number of images to identify? Seems nope. No. Yeah, it could be very, it, this could be one image for some workers. It could be, like, like 
is it Susan Hewitt has done 50,000 identifications. Um, yeah, it's very variable. So you've got to deal with this in data in a sense. Yeah, yeah. Cool. And so the, the system as a whole is a is like a, a hierarchical Bayesian model. So we, we pool across all the workers to learn a generic skill model that people get initialized with. And then once they actually give us data, we can start fine tuning it towards their particular parameters. If that. Okay. So, so yeah, so it's like, <coughs> it's these stacked priors. So the, at the very top level is your prior belief on the skills of your workforce. The intermediate layer is everyone pooled together and just how often are people correct on average? And then the next layer down is individual worker skills. So could you think of these as basically a hierarchical like confusion matrices? So yep. confusion matrix at a like every one level, but yeah. then eventually you build up a confusion matrix for me. Exactly. Yeah. As, as soon as, as you more work. As soon as you've given me enough data to do that, yep, I'll do that. The hierarchy goes across workers, but there's also a hierarchy that I would imagine across species, or do you do any refinement on that? Like, is there any class base within this matrix? Like, can you smooth it in some ways, or? Yeah, and I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll tackle that one okay. as well. Yep. Yeah, yes. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, I was just going to say, is there any form of like collaborative filtering in the sense that, you know, subject A and B have similar skills, and so they actually have similar... So I think that would be a, a, an awesome, like, next extension to this is, so we, the only really rough form of collaborative filtering is that intermediate prior that we learned across all the workers. Right. But to me, it makes yes yeah, sense that you should actually divvy that up into your novice pool over novices. Everyone who's done less than 20 identifications do experts. And then you can start doing these nice collaborative filtering uh, methods. But yeah, basically, you guys are already pointing, you, like, you guys are quicker than I am. You're basically finding all the flaws in this thing. I'll basically build this up and then point those out to you again. And then uh, try to tackle each one. Um, yeah, okay, so let me just give an example of this matrix. Um, and I'll, you guys probably know this quite well, so I'll go through it quickly. <coughs> um, okay, so in this example, a worker is asked to distinguish between four different classes, so plants, mammals, snakes, and, and birds. And, and each worker has one of these matrices, right? So the J uh, is for each worker. And um, we're going to index into this matrix with our Ys. Uh, for the row, and then our z sub ij's for the columns, right? And so uh, let's just assume up front that we know what the label is for an image. So we can show that image to a worker, all right? And we know this is an image of a snake, so we know it goes into this row. We can ask the worker what they think it is. They say snake, so it goes into this entry. We can repeat this for birds, right? They say bird, great. We can repeat, like, flowers, but in this case, they actually make a mistake. So for some reason, they said snake, so this goes off the main diagonal. We can do this for a bunch of images, and this gives us this matrix. Now, if we take these images and sum them up and, and normalize each row independently, so there's the summation, here's our normalization, we arrive at this confusion matrix. I'll call this a skill matrix as well. And what's nice is that each entry in this thing gives us this probability. So this is the likelihood of a worker responding with the label snake when we know that the image really contains a snake. Okay, and if a worker was perfect, they never make a mistake, and we just get this nice diagonal matrix. Uh, how many algorithms do you have for average? It, on average, it's probably something really low on average, probably 10. How about uh, each image? Uh, on average, probably two point something, somewhere between two and three. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, very, it's pretty sparse. Data. Okay, so in general, what are we doing? Well, we're just learning uh, the parameters for a multinomial distribution for each one of these uh, each one of these rows, right? So each row is an independent um, distribution, uh, and we're going to learn this uh, for each worker. <clears throat> okay, so if we have like just assume up front you, we we have those confusion matrices, then our calculation of this likelihood is pretty simple. Um, we're just going to index into the appropriate position for each worker uh, in their matrix, multiply those values together multiply by the prior of that class occurring, um, and that gives us our likelihood. <clears throat> okay, so the problem hits us, like you guys pointed out, when the number of classes gets big. So we've got C squared parameters um, in each one of these matrices, um, and we've got a matrix M for each worker. Um, so our, the, basically like a, a rough model parameter count is, is just those two things multiplied by each other. 
And um, so if we're doing a task with 10,000 classes, so that's like the bird species, um, that means we're going to be computing a matrix with 100 million entries for every worker. And so that's statistically and computationally intractable right, for every worker. Uh, and this isn't even as bad as it gets, like I was saying. So on a naturalist, the user has over 500,000 uh, species options um, when putting an identification on an observation. Okay, so can we do something about this? Can we try to reduce the number of parameters per worker? Um, and we can. We can focus just on the diagonals um, of the matrix. And so in this case, we're going to be learning a single number for every class, and it represents the likelihood of a worker labeling that class correctly. Okay, so this time each parameter represents a Bernoulli parameter. Um, and again, so I, I didn't explain it, but when we're actually estimating these things, we just do really simple map estimation to get, those, to get these confusion matrices, and then maximum likelihood to get the predicted label. And we're going to do the same thing here, so map estimation to get these Bernoulli parameters. Yeah? So are you estimating it by giving some images, like what you described? Do you actually give the images with ground truth, or do you estimate it by looking at consensus? Yeah, just looking at, yeah, so we, have, we do a, an alternating maximization, where we've, we initialize the skill matrices with these priors, estimate the labels, and then, and then go back and forth. I see, so you're doing EM. Yep. But if you're doing an EM estimate, then it's possible for you to rotate all the classes. Because all you want is to maximize the likelihood of observation. Observation is not given to you, so you can just rotate all the classes. Oh, well, what do you mean by rotate? So you can you can say that uh, every one of my users, when they see a snake, they see a flower. Yeah. Well, they say a flower. Okay. And therefore, the correct label is a snake. Um. Okay, so you can apply so any you have to pin it down with something. Otherwise, right? Yeah. Like you have to pin it down somewhere. Right. I mean, <laughs> this diagonal version is pinned because right. because you only you only look at the probability of making a mistake. But the full matrix will allow you to rotate all the classes. Um. Okay. Yeah, I, I'm not. I don't totally follow. So I'll have to like maybe we can talk afterwards. Sure. Um, but yeah. So it's just so. Um, yeah, we, we, yeah we, so we, we never get to see these guys, so we're just going to iterate over all of them. We do get to see these guys. Y becomes a hidden class variable. Yeah. So you're just clustering observations from people. Yeah. When you cluster observations from, from people in EM, you have no control over uh, which class is going to represent what. OK. So you could have that your snake represents snake. Uh, uh, flowers. Oh, I, I understand what you're saying. OK, yeah, sure. So at the end of the day, no, I, I could care less about snakes and flowers. It's just like we, we maintain that mapping. Um, through, it, ultimately what it ends up being is through the taxonomy. Um, but yes, yeah. Okay, so, um, yeah, we're going to try and reduce these um, parameters. Um, and we're going to just focus on the diagonal um, for the, in this first case. Um, but we still need to produce this matrix, right? Like, this is critical for our calculation of the likelihood. We have to be able to index into this matrix with a class label and with um, the worker annotation. And so um, we, we're going to start off with these diagonal entries. And to fill in the rest, we're simply just going to do 1 minus the corresponding diagonal entry. And there's proper um, normalization. I just left it off of the notation to keep it clean. Um, but this allows us to produce this M matrix with just C parameters. <coughs> um, the problem here is that we've given up our ability to distinguish different types of mistakes, right? So um, each of the off-diagonal uh, entries in each row is the exact same value, uh, which isn't the best assumption, right? So you're more likely to confuse ravens with crows um, rather than bluebirds or um, blue jays, but we've given up our ability to make that, um, uh, to distinguish that. And that's just the price you pay for reducing the parameter count of the model. Um, but we can play one little trick. And so we have access to a prior vector for the classes. Right? And so we can make the hypothesis that if a user makes a mistake, the mistake is likely to follow the distribution of classes. Um, so we can effectively scale each off-diagonal entry in each row by the prior of that class occurring. So this results in something that maybe looks a little bit more reasonable, um, although it's still far from reconstructing um, the original per-class multinomial. But remember, we saved ourselves C parameters, a factor of C parameters. Um, and there's actually another trick we can pull. And instead of using the class priors to scale the rows, we can jointly train a computer vision system and use the output probabilities of that model. Okay? And so the reason this is nice is because we're going to get a 
custom per image multiplier um, and that we can use to uh, scale those row entries. Right? So when we just use the class prior, um, it doesn't change for each image. Well, the computer vision can use the data stored in the pixels to update. And so the, the idea here is that this vector is adapting to each image, whereas your class prior just remained fixed. <laughs> okay, so. The subspace model as a linear combination of factors. To save, yeah. So you, then you have, you know, five times c. Sure, you can. So one of the one of the, the uh, five times c, c squared. Actually. One goal of this thing yeah, was, is to squares. always maintain interpretability, to be able to like look at these matrices and know what we're like what the value represents, and so. Part of the problems of like reducing this thing with other techniques is we kind of lose that ability to just like poke and prod the thing. So you just do diagonal plus rank one. Yeah, yeah. You always want to keep the diagonal, I think. Sure, but yeah, you can. Yeah, but you can go further. That's yes. Right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. So we are. So yeah. There's many ways of doing this. This is just like one way of doing it to push even for. Fine. You can have like five different types of mistakes people, five different patterns of mistakes people make. Yeah. <clears throat> to yeah to in order to like to initial, have so, a more more detailed representation of the original C squared matrix. Yes. Yeah. So, I uh, yeah this is you're yeah you're probably annoyed that like I'm making all these simplifying assumptions, but this we're gonna go into a taxonomic model and then we get to use these benefits. Like the taxonomy is going to save us a ton of parameters, and we can just go back to using our C squared model to maintain. Yeah. Um, okay, so yeah, we're going to push this thing even further. We're going to learn one number, one single Bernoulli parameter for every worker, and this base this this represents basically how skilled someone is, with uh, zero being um, so, sort of always wrong and one being um, always correct. Um, and again, we have to construct this matrix, right? So we're going to do the exact same thing. Fill in the diagonal with our one number. Um, we're going to set the off diagonals to one minus that number. Um, and again, and there's normalization terms here, but I've just omitted them. Um, and we can pull the same tricks as before, right? So we can multiply the off diagonal entries by class priors um, or by the output of a computer vision system, um, preferably the, the output of a computer vision system. And so now we can compare our three models, right? So we've got our, our per class multinomial with C squared our per class um, Bernoulli with C parameters, and we've got our minimalist single Bernoulli model with one parameter. Um, and so there's certainly a trade-off in reducing the number of parameters, um, but using the class priors um, or the computer vision system, we can try to reconstruct the original um, but expensive per class multinomial model uh, with far fewer parameters. Right? And so these skill models are the building blocks for the rest of the system, and um, they'll make an appearance a few more times. Uh, the important thing to note um, is uh, we now have a dial to control our model complexity, right? So if running with this model is too expensive, you can go down to this guy. And if this guy is still too expensive, you can go down to this guy. Um, and you can basically try to tune this thing to the, the proper size uh, to handle the computations. Okay, and so yeah, so this goes back to the alternating maximization. So, you know, I don't get away with just knowing, like the class label is never given to us, right? And, and neither are these skill matrices. Um, so we just jointly estimate them. Um, we just iterate back and forth until we hit convergence. Um, and the details for this are just in the paper. OK, um, so we can do a quick sanity check of these models. And this experiment asked uh, mechanical Turk workers and citizen scientists to identify 69 different species of birds. And so all these species um, were either sparrows or shorebirds. And so the task wasn't easy. Um, and we didn't collect a lot of data per worker, right? So the models needed to learn the skills from very few samples. And so let me walk you through these results. Um, each model is separated in, into its own experiment, and the axes line up, so you can just scan horizontally. Um, so we have label error on the y-axis, um, so lower is better. And we have the average number of workers that needed to annotate each image on the x-axis. Right? And so we have three groups of lines in each plot. So the topmost group, uh, are MTurkers. The bottom most uh, group are just citizen scientists. So these are just MTurkers. These are just citizen scientists. And the middle group is um, a combination of the two where we, where we just combine the annotations. Um, in each of those groups, we have four lines. Right? So the red line is majority vote. 
The blue line is um, our basic worker skill model. The orange line is that skill model, um, but using a computer vision system. Um, and the green lines um, relate back actually to a, a more general crowdsourcing framework that I don't really have time to discuss in detail. But that framework is going to use risk estimation for online stopping. Right? So the, the practitioner of this framework can set this threshold tau. And so for each predicted image label, we can compute the risk. And as soon as the risk goes below that tau threshold, we can pull the image from the annotation queue and, call, and, and say that it's done. And so the easiest, the, like one of the easier ways to think about this risk is like for binary classification. So if you're, if you're predicting the label 1, this risk is simply the probability that it, the label is 0. Um, and so as soon as that goes below this threshold, we can remove it from the annotation queue um, and call it done. <coughs> Did you ask each <coughs> subject to self-evaluate, like how skillful they are, and see if there's a correlation between the skill that you predict and the skill that they think they have? Oh, no, that would be yeah, that'd be pretty cool if we if we did. Yeah. So the so the the inspiration for a lot of this work was to be able to put tasks on MTurk where workers come and go, and we don't actually have a fixed workforce, and be able to still combine their their annotations in a probabilistic way. But yeah, we, and we, we do compare, in the paper we have results where we don't ask people to self-report, um, but we make assumptions about where their skill levels should be. So we have experts from the or lab of ornithology do the task versus MTurkers versus citizen scientists, and we compare kind of the performance. I just want to confirm that here you do have the ground truth. Yes. To MTurks, you don't say anything, then you create predictions just based on MTurks. Sorry, yeah. EDM and all that, then compare with the ground truth. Yep. The other question I had is, I was actually thinking about something very similar yesterday for a different project. Uh, you could also put all the computer vision, computer vision models into this mix of people. Exactly. Right? Yes. Have, have you tried that? Um, so we, in our, um, so in this more general framework that, um, was just an earlier paper. Yeah, we, we give people the option of either using computer vision to set priors for annotations or just use computer vision as a worker. And so we, we if it's, the nice thing with, if it's difficult to get your computer vision model to give you probabilistic outputs, we're like, okay, fine, like, then just treat it as a worker and, and incorporate it that way into the system. Um, yeah. But so we haven't, we haven't done an experiment where we're like, um, Let's have group A train a computer vision model and group B train a computer vision model and, and use. Well, I meant, I meant, uh, you could actually take uh, an ensemble of neural networks, yeah. right? Make them all workers, add a bunch of people, and then make experiments to see how many people do you need in the mix before that starts to work really well. Yeah. Yeah. No, and so that's, that's, that's kind of what we're trying to get at with this risk thing because the, so these, these green lines all need to uh, compute this like offline risk of being like, okay, when can we really, like, you know, this is like, um, these multi-class experiments don't quite show it, but the binary experiments, like the computer vision system got good enough where you didn't have to show an image to humans anymore. It was just, you could just send it to the computer vision. You're talking about one. I'm talking yeah. About, I'm talking about ensembling. A lot. Uh, computer vision algorithms and, and, and humans yep. into one system. Right. Yeah. No, that'd be cool. Um, oh, sorry. So, yeah, so now we're back on this. Okay, so... Um, Okay, yeah, so that, that online risk thing just lets us stop early. So you see the rest of these lines continue because we're just, you know, we just keep turning the crank. Um, but these ones, the algorithms can actually report back to us and be like, hey, no, nah, we're, we're done. We're confident on all of our annotations. Um, okay, so we, uh, I'll, these star lines are kind of special. I'll explain them in a second. Um, <clears throat> okay, so we can do some sanity checks. So we want to see that this blue line is like at or below the red line. And that basically means that our basic worker skill models are as, as good or better than majority vote. Um, and that, that checks out. Uh, we also want to see the orange line be below the blue line. So that means that our computer vision system is, is contributing um, and not a detriment. And that checks out. Um, comparing the models, we don't really see much of a difference, which is um, interesting. Uh, that means our... It kind of means a few different things. It means our tricks of reconstructing that skill matrix using fewer parameters is working. Um, but it would have been nice to at least see the more powerful models achieve lower error. Um, and that's actually what's kind of happening here. And so the difference in this experiment is that we initialize the system 
with um, more uh, reliable priors. So all these other experiments were initialized with uninformative, highly conservative priors. And so the, the models, because we weren't getting much data for each worker, the model was having a hard time moving off of that conservative prior. Whereas here, you, you use your knowledge of the task and of your workforce to initialize the system a little bit more reliably, and it can really capitalize on that and drive error pretty low. OK, so those are our basic skill models, uh, and they seem to be working. So we can tackle this dependent annotations now. So we built our, our building blocks, and now let's map it to the iNaturalist um, use case. OK, so we made that independence assumption. Um, and we like that assumption because it keeps the math simple, but it's just not the way a naturalist works, right? So, um, you know, if, if, if it was the way it worked, then that would be assuming that, uh, or that would be as if each one of these workers only looked at the image before providing their annotation. In reality, what happens is that each worker gets to see all of the previous annotations as well as the image, okay? And so, we expect the worker's response to be biased by those prior responses. And so from economics, this is known as herding behavior, and it's been studied in the past. For example, see Banerjee or Sharfstein. Um, but for computer vision data collection tasks, this factor, if present, is normally ignored, um, but we're going to incorporate it into our model. And the first thing we need to do is timestamp the worker annotations, where T represents time. Okay, and so this introduces slightly more annoying syntax, but basically we've just numbered the worker annotations for each image that we can do so that we know who did the first annotation, the second, um, and so forth. And then this h variable um, is just going to contain all of the prior responses up to time t minus 1. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to take this h variable and plug it into our model of the noisy worker responses so that the likelihood of the teeth worker providing their annotation is now conditioned on the fact um, that they got to see all of the prior responses from time t, uh, t equals 1 to t minus 1. Okay, and so um, we can use the chain rule to do some rearranging, um, and we're just going to marginalize um, over the possible annotations to get this thing into a more convenient format, where we've, con we've basically decomposed it into two terms now. Um, this, uh, this first term we know how to compute. All right, this is just what we've been working with this entire time. So we can use this one of our basic noisy worker models um, from before. Um, and then we have uh, this new term, right, which is the likelihood of the previous annotations given what the worker said. Right? And so this term is effectively weighting or biasing the evidence that the worker considers from the image alone. So let me try and draw a diagram of how the model is operating. And again, we're trying to uh, model the annotation response of a worker on the iNaturalist website where they get to view the image and all of the previous annotations before providing their identification. Okay, so our model of the annotation process for a worker basically does two things. First, it's going to assume that the worker will analyze the image and will consider all possible annotations with the likelihood of each possible annotation controlled by their skill matrix. Right? And then for each one of those possible annotations, the worker is going to go see how that annotation fits in with the prior responses. Right? And then they're going to scale the likelihood of that annotation accordingly. Okay? So if you buy into this modeling process, then we need to implement this term. Right? And the first thing we're going to do is make an independence assumption to make the math easy. All right? So we're going to assume that the worker treats each of the previous responses as independent sources of information. Right, so pictorially, it looks like this, where we've simplified the annoying conditional probability into three easier probabilities. Sorry, I'm just trying to figure out the motivation for this. Yes. Yeah. I don't get The way to... of getting out of this would be to say, I won't allow you to see this until you submit your response. Mm -hmm. And then after you see the response, then only then maybe if you feel like it, you change it. Yeah. Yeah, I totally agree with you. The thing is, I don't have control over the INAT website. So I got, there's a, this knowledge community existed before I existed, or before I knew about it, and I just get to like see how they currently operate, and this is how they currently operate. I agree with you, though. Yeah, like let's change the website, let's make this a much easier modeling task, but they don't want to do that yet. Okay, so what's this term? Um, this is a noisy model of the previous worker's response, but conditioned not on the class label like we've been seeing. It's conditioned on what the worker says. All right? And so now we've got this new skill variable, which is worker J's perception of worker K's classification skills. Okay, so 
Let me draw another picture. Every worker has a set of classification skills, right? And we're going to model those skills with the matrix M, right? This is what we did last section. In addition to this, every worker has a set of perceptions of the skills of the other workers on iNaturalist, right? And we're going to model those perceptions um, of the other worker skills using perceived skill matrices denoted as P. Right? And our mechanism for modeling those P matrices is going to be the exact same thing that we did for the matrix M. Namely, we can just use one of our basic worker skill models. Right? And so modeling a worker's perception of all the other workers can get expensive. So instead, we can just pool across all the other workers for each individual worker and get their general perception of the other workers. Right? And again, for this general perception matrix, we can choose one of these basic um, skill models to use. The single Bernoulli model is interesting in this case. It basically captures how trusting a particular worker is of the other workers. <clears throat> and so uh, one last thing before I finish this section. So we made this initial assumption that the worker is going to treat the uh, prior responses as independent sources of information. Um, but we can model the situation where worker J may choose to account for the fact that earlier responses were also biased. Right? And so this leads us to this recursive definition where we iterate um, backwards through the annotations. And at each st time step, we index into the appropriate uh, worker skill matrix. And then we stop um, with the first annotation. Right? So this is this recursive formulation. Um, now, I don't have the, the similar sanity checking experiments like I did from the last section um, for, for these models. Um, this experiment will be presented after the next section, but I just wanted to show you that putting in this effort to adapt the models to dependent annotations really pays off. Um, so we see this like 85% decrease in error um, for the per-class multinomial model compared to majority vote, which is the red line. OK. But here you are actually inferring the skill of the, of the users, right? Or, or perception and so on. Yeah. Uh, and th that's just by ordering of the votes. Yep. Have you looked into how well you're predicting this? Only, um, like, how well I'm predicting like, the perceived. Like does everybody perceive Susan as an expert? Uh, can, I mean, can we you can infer that. We could go in and do, no, I don't have the data to do, like, a, a deterministic experiment on that, but we could go in and look at the output of the model right. and see how well it. skill level is because you are inferring now skill based on psychology sort of yeah yeah so basically people yeah and uh, do you get that do you get that actually people are having perception of susan as an expert so it's, it's actually we we when we looked at it we treated it as like the flip of it so it was more of like how trusting are users and so we found that like novices are highly trusting of the previous annotation whereas someone like susan is actually untrusting because she goes in and fixes so you're not inferring the, the I, I thought that this was a sort of a hidden variable for every it person, is. whether they're novice yeah. or not. Yeah. Then you're inferring it Yes. for, for everybody. everybody. So, so then what is the hidden variable for Susan? Oh, like what is her value? Yeah. Probably, sure. probably like 0.8 for this one. So do you look at that? I mean, the, the, are you actually getting the right values for people? Or so what is the, what do you mean by the right value? Well, when you infer, if I understood this, you're yep. inferring for every user yep. uh, how other people are seeing them as an obvious or as an expert. Yes. So then, so you can look at, uh, somehow try to validate that your model has inferred proper designation of these people, that these people really are considered to be experts. Yeah, so only, like, I can't do that. Like, I gave the tool to the INAT guys uh -huh. and they got to look at the results. And? and they like, like how the system is predicting confidences. But it's, it's very much like a, but, a qualitative but rather than. The, the system is inferring the quality of people? Yeah. They do? Yeah, they, they, they are liking the output of the system. Well, the output that's, overall. Yeah. yeah. But you don't know if that's, yeah, okay. Yeah, no, I mean, there's like a lot of numbers to go in and, and look at. But, yeah, uh, it's just very fascinating that, that if you have enough data, you can see that just by sequence of votes and that you can infer. Yeah. Yeah, so like I, it's like I was saying, a lot of the things that we did to like sort the output of the model in order to go do like quality control to see like was there a bug in the system was like go look at these guys who aren't trusting and the guys who aren't trusting are the ones that are going through and basically fixing identifications right so there was there was a sequence of of there's agreeing species ids 
and then a third user came in and disagreed with those two. And that third user typically was an expert who was, like, could point out the flaws to the novices. Kind of collapse onto when in the sequence do you come in? Yeah, so these experiments were done uh, where we exclude people. We don't allow people to change their minds. So when we constructed the data set for these, people got to give us one, um, one answer, essentially. And it was their first answer. OK, so the final thing is um, taxonomic models. Um, OK, so we've been doing this um, multi-class classification task uh, where we have a list um, of classes or species um, from which workers can choose. Uh, and so that list would be of size 10,000 for birds. And so another way to interpret this list is a flat taxonomy, uh, where each species in the list now corresponds to a leaf node in the taxonomy. So workers have been providing leaf node annotations. Um, iNaturalist, though, um, rather than having a flat taxonomy, has a big, dense taxonomy sitting on top of all these species nodes. Um, and so we have a plant subtree, an insect subtree, a bird subtree. And inside um, the bird subtree, we have like the perching bird subtree, the shorebirds, um, and so forth. And, and there's some nice ad advantages of utilizing a taxonomy. Right? So workers can hedge their bets if they're not sure of the class label. And so what do I, what do I mean by this? So in this observation, um, I specified genus uh, as the uh, label because I wasn't certain about the species. Um, and so rather than being forced to take a guess, um, the iNaturalist interface allows me to hedge my bets and I can provide only a genus annotation. And so then the more skilled identifiers could come in um, and provide species labels. Um, secondly, another benefit is that we get to reduce the model parameters by not modeling confusions between um, classes located in different subtrees. All right, so it's probably not necessary to model the confusion between burrowing owls and passion flowers. All right, so this entry in the worker skill matrix will probably be zero uh, for those two classes, and it would be great if we didn't have to store or compute that zero value. Um, and a taxonomy gives us this information. Right? We have passion flowers sitting in one subtree, burrowing owls sitting in another subtree. And we can use that to restrict which entries of the confusion matrix we will compute. So in the resulting structure, we'll have this sort of block diagonal shape. And doing this results in huge parameter savings. Right? So consider the ode subtree. Um, odes are dragonflies and damselflies. So there's about 6,000 species of them. And using non-taxonomic models, um, so these are models that can't take advantage of uh, inner node labels from workers. You get this top row uh, of parameter counts, uh, while the bottom row shows the parameter counts for taxonomic models. Uh, and so notice the significant parameter savings here for this per-class multinomial. The star here is actually for, um, this is an overestimate for this model. The savings can be um, even better. Um, OK, so how do we adapt our models to a taxonomy? All right, so we can go back to our simple four-way classification task that I illustrated before. And so um, we can reinterpret this as a task, a classification task over a flat taxonomy. Um, so we've got our root node and our four leaf nodes. Um, and if our class label is snake and the worker label is snake, then we can compute the likelihood of this worker response um, by first retrieving the skill matrix for the worker, which we can interpret as being stored in the parent of the worker's annotation. And then we simply index into the appropriate um, entry to get the probability. OK, so now if we grow the tree so that we have our class label and our worker annotation down here, all we're going to do is traverse from the root node to this leaf node and simply repeat the process that we just did in the flat taxonomy case. All right, so we'll access and multiply by the probability that this worker labeled um, this level one node correctly, followed by level two, um, and finally level three. And so we can render the skill matrices um, for these nodes and visualize the matrix uh, indices that we're accessing. All right, so we've got the first level where we access the skills uh, in the matrix stored at the root node, um, the second level, uh, and the third. And for like illustrative purposes, we can just sort of follow what index we're indexing into. Um, and so, you know, as if the class label moved to here, you know, now we're indexing into this entry. This looks good. This looks good. This is also fine. So this is a worker hedging their bets and just giving us, you know, like a genus label. Um, but this is bad. 
Um, so when computing the likelihood of a worker's annotation, when that annotation and the class label are in different subtrees, um, we can't use our normal formula, right? There's no um, row entry for this y value stored in this matrix M. Um, and so to fix that, we're going to incorporate this extra vector in, uh, which is going to, uh, we'll, we'll store this at each one of these inner nodes. And that vector just stores the parameters for a multinomial distribution that captures a worker's likelihood of choosing a child node, right? So as soon as these paths for the y and the z deviate, we're going to stop indexing into these n matrices and simply index into these n vectors. Okay, and so mathematically, this looks like the following. Uh, we're just going to be traversing uh, from the root node to the worker's annotation. And at each level, we're going to be multiplying by the probability that the worker provided that annotation, given a particular class label. And this value is either going to come from a, an entry in the skill matrix, if the ancestor of the class label and the ancestor of the worker annotation match. Otherwise, we're just indexing into these um, in vectors. <coughs> Um, and of course, to implement the skill matrix, we can choose from one of our basic models again, right? which we can store at each inner node. So we have our per child node multinomial, our per child node Bernoulli, or the single Bernoulli. And we can do the exact same thing for the skill perception matrices when modeling the dependence between worker annotations. Right? So we're just going to use the exact same taxonomic framework, but we're going to be using P and R instead of M and N. <coughs> Okay, so that's everything. All right, we created this classification um, skill models, uh, these basic guys, and then we updated them to handle the dependence between the annotations, and then we updated them to handle um, annotations coming from a taxonomy rather than a flat list. All right, so we started off with something basic, um, and then we adapted it to match the way workers actually use iNaturalist. And so let's see how these models perform. Um, so. Uh, we'll use iNaturalist data this time. And so we sampled research grade observations from 30 bird species and constructed a data set where we allow uh, only a user's first identification for an observation to be included. Um, so we've removed all the identifications where a user was convinced to change their mind. Um, and then the ground truth was collected through an alternative um, interface. And so for this experiment, I'll focus on the per class multinomial model and I'll highlight the contribution of each uh, system. So the red line um, is majority vote, uh, and the blue line is the basic worker skill model. <clears throat> so using a taxonomic model decreased error by 36% um, over majority vote. Modeling the dependence among annotations resulted in an 85% decrease in error. And using both the taxonomic and handling of the dependence and annotations resulted in a 90% decrease in error. Right? So overall, we've got this system now that's able to um, figure out kind of the worker skills and starting to combine those skills appropriately. All right, and so now the question is, can we just run this thing across the entire iNaturalist database um, where we've got 12 million observations, um, 30 million identifications, and 300,000 users? Um, and sure, um, but we're going to do a few things first. Um, we're going to sanitize the taxonomy, right, so that it consists of only the seven quote-unquote classic ranks you know, so these are your kingdom, phylum, class. Um, so this gets rid of stuff like suborder or intrafamily. Um, so it just makes the taxonomy um, more manageable. Um, and the other nodes that we get rid of are just folded up into the nearest ancestor. Um, and then rather than running one giant model where you start at like life, which would be a, like an extra of the root node would be like here, we're going to run uh, parallel models at this class node. Um, and so examples of classes include like birds, reptiles, insects. These are like your popular grouping of, of wildlife. <clears throat> and we're going to use our cheapest models um, to try and speed up the learning process. So we're just going to use these taxonomic single binomial models and these taxonomic um, uh, for both the worker skills and the perceived worker skills. Okay, so I don't have ground truth data for this, right? Like I don't know what the right answer is. So this is where we kind of do our qualitative analysis of the data. And so for every observation, what we're going to get out is we're going to get a prediction of, uh, we're going to get a species prediction for every observation, right? And then we're going to get a confidence value um, for that species. And so how do we run quality controls? Like, you know, basically the questions you're asking, like how do we know whether the system's doing a good job? Well, one thing we can ask or we can look for is we should, we should probably require all research-grade observations to have a high confidence in the species prediction. 
right? Those are those observations that we send off to do distribution modeling. Okay, so what we can do is we can go find the research grade observations that have low confidence and see what's up with those. And so when we do that, we find observations like this, um, where we've got two agreeing species IDs, um, but the model's confidence is actually kind of low. So this is a research grade um, observation with an only an 89 percent confidence, and, and that's actually good because this is a millipede, um, so it's not a wood louse. Um, and so this is an example of sort of like two either novice or poor identifiers um, corrupting the database. Um, and um, looking at the logs, it seems like this this user actually used the computer vision system to get this potentially to get this um, ID, and then um, this user has agreed with that ID. And, um, and so it's nice to see that the, the model is kind of requiring more annotators to come in to look at this before it becomes confident um, in the prediction. Um, we can do similar things for needs ID. So we can kind of flip this around. So we can be like, what are all the needs ID observations um, where the confidence is very high in the predicted species? And we get observations like this, where we've got two conflicting species identifications, but the model is highly confident in this second one. Um, and so uh, this actually relates back to that overriding incorrect identifications problems, right? So um, this first worker has provided an incorrect identification. And before, we would need three more people to come in um, to override this. But the system is now confident in Dan's skills and is able to trust his prediction. And we also find lone expert observations like this one. Right? So only one person has put an identification on this um, observation. And um, the system is, is highly confident in, in this user's skills. And so it doesn't actually need anybody else to come in and contribute. So this, this goes back to this like using your resources more efficiently. right? We can put our workforce on other um, observations that need to be fixed rather than letting people look at this one. <clears throat> and um, so another output is these taxonomic skills for all the workers. And so I don't look at the perceived um, thing. I just look at their skills. And we can ask questions like, who is skilled at, at identifying um, the genus Budio, um, which is a genus of like where the red-tailed hawk is is contained in, and we get this list of users out, right? So, um, you know, these are actually like all very skilled users on iNaturalist, um, and it's nice to see that this system kind of just gives you this list of like if you had a question about this genus, like okay, here's the people that you probably want to go ask a question to. Same thing for um, the family Pika, um, which this guy's a member of. Um, you know, again, we can query the system and get this list of users back. <clears throat> okay, perhaps the most convincing experiment, though, is this proxy computer vision. So I showed these numbers um, before. Uh, these are the top one accuracy numbers for off-the-shelf um, and um, an expensive model um, on the iNaturalist 2018 data set. So that 2018 data set was constructed by taking um, basically the entire iNaturalist database and just sub-selecting the research grade observations and constructing the data set that way. Um, so that's basically like doing a two-thirds, like you have, you started off in this big image collection and you did two-thirds majority vote and whatever passed that threshold came into your data set to train your model. An alternative thing that you could have done is start off from that big data set and run the crowdsourcing model and get a data set that way. And that results in this uh, entry. And so this is our multi-class crowdsourcing system and we can see this nice jump up in performance, right? This is just, this is like literally download Inception v3 from the TensorFlow repo and train up on this different data set. Same classes, but just different labels for the images. And we see this nice improvement in images. Yeah, our results. Can you compare that with uh, alternative approach? Alternative approach would be just train on everything. Yeah. Uh, or, or, and also, um, did you reduce the number of species here if you only have highly confident predictions? Uh, you might ex exclude a lot of research grade con uh, predictions. Then you have maybe not eight thousand, but six thousand species. Oh, for the for like, like how do you compare those two numbers? Oh, so, how do you so compare it with just how, how much is it just more data? Yeah. And how much is it cleaner data? How much is it reduction in the number of classes and so on? Can yeah. You comment on that. So there's no reduction in classes. It's the same. This the 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 species that were picked are the same in both. The experiment. That we need that is like currently running is this. What if you just train on everything in the database? Um, and um, yeah, I'm not sure where that falls into the spectrum, um, but this is this is a factor of. So here, the INET 2018 data set roughly has uh, 500,000 images. This data set has three million. 
So we have a factor of six increase there. I don't think I would attribute all of this gain to just a factor of six, but yeah, I'm sure it puts you somewhere in, in this range. Because in the previous experiments, you were not <coughs> showing that there's a huge uh, increase in uh, decrease in the error. I mean, there is a big decrease, but you're going from 0 0.1 to 0 0.01 or something, yeah. something no. like that, right? Yeah. Uh, which is, but this, uh, th that's uh, usually in machine learning, uh, that wouldn't, that uh, increase, that decrease in the noise in the labels wouldn't uh, lead to this decrease. Yeah. In the noise in the predictions. No, so, so, right, so there's a few things. Okay, so yeah, I guess this experiment is actually more complicated than you think to run because of the, the oddness of the hierarchy. So it's, it's this system, like the only thing that we start off the same, or actually there's two common constraints between these two experiments. First is the final species that it has to make predictions over, and the test set is fixed between these two. The second thing that's the same is that the, 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 the pool of images and, and labels to start from is the exact same. And so um, this model actually chooses to train a taxonomic um, computer vision system. So it's able to actually, it's able to utilize data that didn't even make it to species uh, nodes. And so it's, there's actually a, like a sequence of experiments that need to be run here to see how this increase in data helps. Because not all the data that this guy got is sitting at species. Yeah. A lot of it's actually in genus or family because that's just like the only labels we got to play with. Um, yeah, no, but I agree. There's definitely some like dots here that need to be filled in to give the full story. But the, I mean, regardless, this is encouraging. This is like sweet. Like with images with just one observation, we can get a, we can get a uh, confidence on that thing, throw it into our training pool, and see some um, increase in performance. Um, and that was it. Okay, so oh, yeah, and I didn't train this. Like, I don't. Uh, these are competition models that are like um, big and expensive, and so I'm not sure how um, a competition style uh, ensemble would perform in this data set. But I'm guessing it would be pretty good. In the taxonomy based classification is the trained model always trying to predict the leaf node, or can it stop after predicting the intermediate node? Um, so the for this experiment, we force it to go all the way down to species. Okay. But you could imagine doing um, an entropy. Right, so both that way, both of them are comparable. Yes. Both that, those two entries are both trying to always predict. Always go to species. And the ground truth is no. Yeah. <coughs> but at training time, you're saying that some of the images oh, yes. have been labeled yes. completely. Like yep, yep. No labeling has been missing. Yeah, sorry. So that's a multitask learning output. So we're learning kingdoms, phylums. Etc. down the species. So there's extra training signal there. So that's like uh, seven different classifiers. Mm -hmm. okay. Yep. Yeah, where then we just strip off just the species one to run the test results. Okay, so that was that. Um, that was our multi-class crowdsourcing. And uh, I'm running super low on time, so I'll just quickly go through these next steps. Basically, um, uh, I'll skip. I want to get to this. OK, so right now, where, we, where I'm stopping um, after my PhD is some kind of model representation of humans and then models for computer vision, right? We have these two things. And um, I would like to, you know, like sort of in the future, it'd be cool to like go back to human in the loop style systems where these guys get to work together to achieve some goal, right? And so that goal could be as simple as just identification. Um, so in this, this example, I said genus because I got this flat list of species back. And looking at these things, some of these things look very similar. And so I was like, mm, I'm just going to back off and say genus. So what kind of interaction would it take for me to be confident about the species? Does the, could the model ask me where I was when I took the photo? Could it ask about clicking on different parts of the, the object? Um, is it about attributes? You know, could the machine just ask me, like, what's the color of the side? And then tell me that, oh, you know, only a particular species has that color um, for the side. Um, and this is a particularly, like, nice one with models that run on the phone, is you get this immediate interaction with the computer, and one of the feedbacks could be to get a different perspective of the object, right? So it's, like, you start from here, and the computer could actually ask you, like, hey, could you just, like, go get a different perspective? 
in order to like fix some ambiguity between two different, uh, a few different species. Um, the next one is, is learning, right? So now it's like, I want to learn about this genus, the subtree of the hierarchy. You know, teach me about it. And so, you know, this, the goal is to improve the user's skills um, on, on those nodes. And so what would a machine need? Well, you know, it would need to know about this taxonomy. It would need to know about attributes. Um, it would need to know about what species are commonly confused. So it would need to learn from other people. Um, and, uh, you know, it would need to know about what, what kind of rules help distinguish those species. And, and how do you communicate those rules to a novice? You know, like how do you... How do you take the rules that an expert is using and help a novice also learn them? Um, and then, of course, how do you efficiently evaluate those skills, right? Um, and then finally, like one last thing that just merges those last two, one is like a super generic um, exploring the world, right? So this, this user stopped at Red Rock Canyon State Park in Southern California. They have their phone and they want to explore the area. You know, what's it going to take? What... What is out there, first of all? What are identification tips based off of their previous uses? What would they find interesting to go look for, um, et cetera? And um, yeah, and so like I've, I've, I've taken steps towards these things with Steve back before um, I started my PhD. And so I'd like to actually return to those. And then uh, a postdoc at Caltech is, is exploring the teaching things. But I think the time is right to build a big data set around this thing and really try to um, study it thoroughly. And I think we could do that with um, the right partners. <clears throat> okay, so yeah, hopefully today I've convinced you uh, that we've, we've kind of taken these, these steps towards learning from these communities um, and then distilling the knowledge of that community and making it accessible. And so I'd like to say thanks to Microsoft for letting me talk. Um, thanks to my collaborators on this work, so Steve, Scott, Serge, and Pietro. Um, and thanks to you guys for listening. We have a couple minutes for questions. Otherwise, most of you guys, I think, are, are talking to Grant offline, so you can chat then. Any, any final? For the outsourcing part, uh, when you're trying to uh, assess the skill level, and especially in the, in the second part where you have these interpersonal like, the perception of he thinks he's an expert. <coughs> so in these crowdsourcing models, how do you handle this fundamental issue that somebody who speaks up more often yeah. will likely be making mistakes versus somebody who only speaks up when they know they're really confident yeah. for the answer? So, this, this must come up in all kinds, not just vision every, everywhere there's crowdsourcing. How is this tackled? Yeah, so we, we've got qualitative examples of particular users on iNaturalist that we know aren't skillful and the system does like they in but they contribute a lot you know they're they're constantly adding identifications across the board and the system does learn that people are typically disagree with their identification and then is able to downweight the the skill estimates for those users um, and then yeah i mean the system we can't um, so one of the nice like things with iNat is it's very democratic like everyone starts at the same spot and there's no, you don't, you can't come in, even if you're a card carrying expert, you know, like, like I'm a professional ornithologist, you know, you, INET gives you no, there's nothing special about you, yeah. And so the models need, you need to interact with the system in order for us to learn your skills. And so one nice thing is that this, like, deploying this kind of a system actually um, gives us a way of, of, of telling those card carrying experts, like, hey, if that's true, then, like, contribute some identifications. And the system will start learning that you're skillful in those areas. Do you think you need another variable somewhere like when you get an image, there's some um, difficulty level of this image. And depending on who answers this image correctly, you can get a little bit more confident about who's really an expert. Yeah, no, yeah, exactly. So our, um, the more general framework for all of this, um, which handles collecting bounding boxes and key points, um, in binary annotations, takes into account that image difficulty um, flag. We didn't bother incorporating it here. Um, but yes, no, I agree with you. I think that that's, for some of these tasks, especially like ambiguous bounding box tasks, it's just difficult to know. And it'd be nice to raise those systems. Basically, this whole thing acts as a really nice quality control mechanism. And so if you have a way of sorting your data set by these ambiguous variables, you can go in and decide 
whether you want that data, and if you do, what is the right answer for it? All right, well, it's 12, so let's thank Grant again. And, uh...